This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Very great pleasure for me to welcome you to the Dean's Seminar this afternoon. I'm going to introduce my colleague, Professor Alistair Hamilton, who is the Arcadian Visiting Research Professor at the Warburg Institute and the co-director of the Centre for the History of Arabic Studies in Europe, CHASE, which is devoted to the study of the intellectual, scientific and cultural relations between the Arabic world and Western Europe between the Middle Ages and the 18th century. Professor Hamilton has published important books on, so there's a little bit of seating just at the front. Professor Hamilton has published important books on the Radical Reformation, the family of love, early modern scholars of Islam and the Arabic world, the Copts and the West, and on cultural relations between the Arabic world. Today he's going to be talking about one of the um, key underpinning points of, um, of the study of, of Arabic in, in, in the West, the acquisition of manuscripts. And his title, as you can see, is Routine, Stealing and Purchasing, the Western Acquisition of Arabic Manuscripts in the Early Modern Period. Thank you very much. In the kind of honesty, let me introduce Chase, who didn't say it was a fact, it was very much in the area and I'd like to thank you. And I get a very good one. As a young woman from the Pacific on Pia, the object of Chase is basically to give you some as complete a history as possible of the Arabic studies in Europe in the early modern period. One of the aspects that we've studied are yeah, translations of the Quran that we had a conference. We are trying to map from on, online the study of Arabic in Europe. And also to provide a detailed survey of Arabic manuscripts acquired in the early modern period by European collectors. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. The first point that the report will made is the question of period. Although it's very difficult sometimes to differentiate neatly between the early period, the Middle Ages, and the early modern period, in the case of the collection of Arabic manuscripts, it actually fits rather well. Because in the Middle Ages, we know very little, incidentally, about the acquisition of Arabic manuscripts in the West in the Middle Ages. We don't know how they were collected. But from the many translations that appear, we do know what was collected. And I think it's safe to say that in the Middle Ages, there was a general consensus about what was important and what was not. In other words, European collectors or Europeans interested in Arab culture could, by consulting learned Arabs, immediately get a complete idea of the important philosophers, the important writers on medicine, the important writers on science more generally, more generally um, the important thinkers writing in Arabic, many of course of whom were Persian. This changes, this changes in the 16th century. On the one hand, there's a very gradual change. The gradual change is due to an increasingly critical attitude on the part of European scholars and humanists who all the Arabic translations of Greek texts. And also, at a slightly later stage, to the evolving scientific revolution, when more and more emphasis in the West was placed on direct observation and experimentation, while it was considered that, in fact, the Arabic texts on medicine were frozen in the past and were not necessarily following the development which could be followed in Europe. But the question of taste also meant that European taste was changing, quite apart from a decreasing interest in Arabic science. There was a growing interest in antiquarianism and the history of Islam, in the history of the Arab world in general, which meant that a different sort of manuscript at one point was in demand from the sort of manuscript that had been in demand in the Middle Ages. 
That's one point. But the other point is the political situation, which in a sense is even more important and which had a direct impact on the manner in which manuscripts were collected. Because with the gradual, well, not so gradual, let's say the rise in the establishment of the Ottoman Empire in the first half of the 16th century, we find that half, or actually if you look at it geographically, slightly more than half of Europe was at war with the Ottoman Empire, and slightly less than half of Europe had diplomatic relations <coughs> with the Ottoman Empire. And so these two, this division into areas, had a very, very considerable effect on the actual means in which manuscripts were entered. The part that, of course, was of more was the empire. In other words, the Habsburg Empire, Austria, Austro-Hungary, most, almost all of Germany, Italy, Spain, and often as an ally, Poland. The countries that had diplomatic relations were France, England, and Holland in that order. And so there was, from the beginning, a considerable diversity between the manner in which the empire was collecting Arabic manuscripts and the manner in which, for example, the French were. Now, another point that should be added as an introduction is the sort of Arabic manuscript that we find in early European collections. And there is a striking feature, which I think more experts on subjects such as Geoffrey would agree, and that is that perhaps not the majority, but certainly a very, very, very great number indeed, are incomplete. Um, they can be incomplete in different forms. They can either be a single or more than a single volume of a multi-volume work, or they could be miscellaneous manuscripts of a series of mutilated works, frequently without a title. The unhappy John Bainbridge, the mathematician and astronomer, in 1626, wrote to a friend referring to the manuscripts at the Bodleian as prisoners in the library. Autore nescio quo, dele nescio qua. In other words, he didn't know who the author was, and he didn't know what the subject was, and very few people could answer those questions either. It would take the great Arabists of the 19th century really to sort out what was in the manuscripts. But this is a recurring characteristic. <coughs> but how are they collected? Well, the first means, and now of course we're talking about Islamic manuscripts primarily, and the countries at war. And this was as loot. It's possible, if you look at the European collections of early manuscripts, the early collections, to document the various Christian victories against the Ottomans simply from the inscriptions in the manuscripts, uh, the date of which the manuscript was acquired. To begin with, there weren't many victories. To begin with, it was mainly the Ottomans who were victorious. But starting in 1535 with the sack of Tunis by Charles V, we start getting a gradual and irregular flow of manuscripts. It should be pointed out that the sack of Tunis, it's not always quite clear what, was, what comes from the sack of Tunis and what doesn't. A great many manuscripts are attributed to the sack of Tunis, which might then come from other sources. But the sack of Tunis meant that not only were warriors captured and manuscripts taken from warriors in person, but above all it means that mosque libraries, madrasa libraries, the libraries of Tunis were ransacked, and consequently some very, very good manuscripts could be discovered and brought to Europe. After that, there are mainly the great battles. The Battle of Lepanto in 1571, and then the various battles along the Hungarian border, of Fölek, Stuhl, Weissenburg of the 1590s. The great, of course, the sack of Vienna in 1683, when the Polish and Austrian army ransacked the Turkish camp. A series of victories, and also one great act of piracy, and that was in 1612 when Spanish presidents, absolutely clear exactly what happened, but 
the Sultan of Morocco was transporting his library, apparently, to Agadir from the north. And the vessel was a French vessel. And the vessel is not quite clear where or exactly how, was captured by Spanish pirates who took it to Spain. And the entire library was thus, as it were, taken prisoner and carried to the Escolian. The only problem there is that we don't know exactly what it contained, because shortly before it had been properly catalogued, there was the most terrible conflagration in the Escolian in 1671 and when and how the manuscripts were destroyed. So it's not completely clear what it contained. So an act of piracy, act of war, the looting of corpses, the looting of pets, the looting of prisoners, and then prisoners of war who might have had manuscripts. Now, before one might be tempted to express any more indignation about this manner of acquiring manuscripts, it should also be remembered that very many of the Arabic manuscripts in Istanbul were already the result of looting. Uh, when, as the Ottoman army spread through the Arab world, they tended to help themselves to the Arabic language. So this was a perfectly acceptable <coughs> means, let's say, of acquiring manuscripts, not to be confused, and I'll be returning to this shortly, not to be confused with theft. So the looting of an enormous number of manuscripts had certain striking disadvantages from the point of view of a collector. The looters, the soldiers, were not, of course, trained Arabists. They were consequently, when they entered the library or when they inspected a corpse, they were attracted far more by the spectacular than by the useful or the edifying. As a result, nearly all the manuscripts they looted were Korans. Korans with fine illumination, those could immediately be spotted as desirable, whereas far more interesting manuscripts, which weren't so spectacular, were left where they were. The result is that the German libraries, particularly, had extremely, or had at the time, extremely top heavy collections. There was a preponderance of Korans, masses and masses of Korans. The Korans, of course, didn't only end up in the libraries. I mean, they were looted, they could, of course, be sold, but they could be presented to princes, they could be presented to friends, they could be kept as souvenirs, they had various functions. But there was certainly a very, very great prevalence of Korans, and a striking absence of Arabic texts which could really help anybody in any way to understand the Arab civilization, Arab culture. There are exceptions to this. This, for example. This is a manuscript which was taken at the Battle of Lepanto. The Battle of Lepanto is described in some detail, the number of ships, the number of, not so much the number of soldiers, but the general development of the battle. And this is not a Quran. This is an indication that Ottoman warriors were, some of them, extremely learned. This is a legal commentary. It's a commentary by Mahboudi on a legal, a Hanifite legal text by Marirani of the 13th century. The manuscript itself, of course, is much later. And this is something I should also add, that um, it looks as though it belonged to Scaliger, when it never did. This was one of many manuscripts which were in the 18th century, which was simply attributed by a rather careless librarian who didn't know much Arabic to the Scaliger collection, but would never, never belong to Scaliger. And this, as I say, is an exception. Otherwise, we have an enormous amount of Qurans. I mean, one of the Quran, which I've seen a photograph, which I think is in the Österreichische Nationale Bibliothek, actually has a hole in it and a blood stain around the hole. So one can see the manner in which so many of these manuscripts were acquired. Now, some manuscripts, particularly those taken from libraries, libraries, well, that was the best bet. I mean, if you wanted a really good selection, a valuable selection of manuscripts, which could be used for studying Arabic, for studying the language, for studying the culture, the best bet was a library. And the Vatican, for example, one of the very first um, Islamic manuscripts to enter the Vatican was a beautiful copy 
um, taken probably from Julius of the legend by Yaguar Yad, which is illustrated and is quite exceptional rarity. But there were very, very few of such manuscripts. By and large, as I said, they were nearly all Quranic. So, looting for the countries of war with the Ottoman Empire was possibly the most frequent channel. There were other channels too, but looting was undoubtedly the most frequent as the original, let's say, the, the very origin, the very problems of manuscripts, which then passed through many hands. But let's turn to another means of acquiring Arabic manuscripts, which was primary to begin with, the means preferred by those countries of peace with the Ottoman Empire, which had diplomatic relations in Holland and France, uh, and which later, as the hostilities diminished, could also be extended to Germans. And that was the most dangerous and the most uncertain way of buying Arabic manuscripts, which was to do so directly. Now, unfortunately, we don't have much information about how the very early collectors did this. By the early collectors, I mean the Dutch professor of Arabic, Gorius, who spent many years in the Arab world, um, the Englishman Edward Pocock, and various others. We have information of a much more detailed nature from a slightly later period. But I think that the information is probably valid for the entire early modern period, or probably well into the 19th century. The danger of buying manuscripts directly was that hardly anywhere, in fact, I go so far as to say nowhere in the Arab world, was it possible to buy Korans or Quranic commentaries which would contain the text of the Quran. I mean, here we have this could be extended almost indefinitely to all Arabic manuscripts. I mean, there's a very interesting person by Franz von Domba, who was one of the products of the um, Austrian interpreter school, who was in Morocco in the late 1780s and early 1790s, who said that the Moroccans would not sell a foreigner any manuscript in Arabic. Not only would they not do that, but they also wouldn't teach in Arabic. He, in fact, managed to get a friend who late in the evenings, he said, surreptitiously gave him Arabic lessons, and so he learned Moroccan Arabic quite well. But he said that the Moroccans themselves would never, never dream of selling um, Islam, well, of selling an Arabic manuscript to a Westerner or to a Christian. Dombay gives a rather unlikely interpretation of this, saying that they were aware of the propagandistic purposes to which these manuscripts were put in the West. And then Dombay gives us an example, Marachi's translation of the Quran, in which indeed a great deal of Islamic material is used to confute Islam. But it seems to me so unlikely that the Moroccans had the slightest interest in or knowledge of what was being published in Europe, that it was surely simply a refusal to allow uh, the hands of the infidel to defile the sacred text. Now, the refusal to sell Korans seems to have been a rule in the Arab world, even in Istanbul. And Istanbul was the market which everybody made for. It was by far the richest. In Istanbul, you could be sure of finding manuscripts in the three great languages of the Ottoman Empire, in Arabic, the language of the Koran, in Persian, the language of the poets, and in Turkish, the language of the administration. Um, but in Istanbul, manuscripts were colossally expensive. Even people accustomed to expensive books in Europe would find Ottoman manuscripts costing anything up to 10 times as much. Of course, they were very labor intensive, but they were extremely expensive. <coughs> now, we have one very valuable about exactly what it was like to buy a manuscript in Istanbul. And this is by a fascinating orientalist and explorer called Zetsin, Ulrich Jasper Zetsin. And Zetsin was an unlucky man. He, well, he'd been lucky for about 10 years. He left Germany. He was working. <laughs> he was buying primarily for the Duke of Saxe Gotha, for the Library of Gotha. And that's where his manuscripts now are. Those are came back. He was also collecting antiquities of the Tsar, uh, and he was making observations on his own account. He was an interesting and enlightened 
Vietnam, a very enlightened man with no prejudices against Islam. Um, when he refers to the Jewish Schwerman, the Jewish dreamer, he's referring to Jesus Christ. And he was a great admirer of Spinoza. Now he, as I said, is a late phenomenon. He was in Istanbul in 1802, and he spent about six months in Istanbul. Then he spent two years in Aleppo. Then from Aleppo he went to Damascus, he went south, he went to Mecca. And finally, in 1811, with an enormous baggage train, and that really was his undoing. He was murdered in central Yemen by people who thought that his baggage train might contain things of inestimable value. But Zaytsev is a fascinating figure, and he left a very detailed diary of what it was like in Istanbul to collect manuscripts in the early 19th century. And he says that the booksellers usually behaved according to a certain pattern. The first thing that they would do would be to ask, of course, anything up to five times as much as the manuscript was worth. Once you got over that hurdle, then you notice that they were actually trying to send one other manuscript, not the manuscript you want. <laughs> After that, they would, into what might seem to have been the manuscript you wanted, paste a number of headings, which really were from the manuscript you wanted, but onto pages from a completely different manuscript. <laughs> Uh, they would then go further still, and they would change the catchwords at the bottom of the page, uh, according to the ones in the original manuscript, thus making total nonsense with the manuscript and rubbing out the catchwords which were originally there. And then, finally, they would be terribly, terribly reluctant to give anybody any change. Zetsin goes on in this at some length. He says that they would try to show another manuscript, change the subject, talk about something else, and get you out of the shop without having to move any change at all. So we'll have to be very, very careful and very insistent about that. So it was an extremely difficult mission to go directly to the booksellers. Some people managed to do it. I mean, there's a description by Antoine Gallon in 1672, who was in Istanbul, and he clearly had no difficulties at all in going to the old town uh, and buying directly. He bought a great many, he was working mainly for Colbert, and he bought a great many Persian manuscripts, mainly the manuscripts of the Bodhisattva, Saadi, poetic manuscripts. And there he never talks really about being cheated particularly, about having to pay too much. It would seem that he had few problems. But a lot of it depended on how he would dress, and how well you spoke whatever language was required. The hostility um, towards clothes is very evident in the case of a slightly later collector, Konstantin Tischendorf, who was famous, of course, for the Codex Signaticus, which actually made its way out of um, the Sinai Monastery of St. Catherine into the Russian um, collection of the Tsar. Um, Tischendorf, in 1844, went to a book market in Cairo together with a friend, and they were wearing Western dress. And Tishendorf says that within a very short time, they approached a seller of Islamic manuscripts. Within a very short time, they were surrounded by a crowd which was so hostile that they had to escape as fast as they could. So it depended, on the other hand, Zetzer, who probably, when he arrived in Istanbul, knew very little Turkish and hardly any Arabic. After two years in Aleppo, his Arabic was quite good. He consistently wore Eastern dress. And he says that he could pass as a Muslim. He doesn't say that he could pass as an Arab, which is not a bad point. But he says that he could pass as a Muslim. So he was in a slightly stronger position. But if one looks at the manuscripts that he collected, the manuscripts in the book, <coughs> we see exactly what happened. A great many of them were totally worthless. They are the miscellanies, the mutilated miscellanies, with which he was cheated by various bookstores in Istanbul. Now, another means, it perhaps shouldn't really be added to um, the true collection of Arabic manuscripts, but one fairly common means of acquiring let's say, something that resembled a manuscript, 
was to have it copied. Now, although this is actually the subject in itself, um, I would just like to show you one example, which has been discovered by my colleague Jan Loeb, the organizer of Chase, in the course of his research on the Swiss Orientalist Hottinger in the 1630s. Now, what happened here, and it's not in my experience that infrequent, is that there was an original manuscript, probably 13th century, perhaps taken with the siege of Tunis, at least that's what it's reputed to have happened to it, which either Hottinger himself or somebody else copied with the utmost exactitude, and the copies have, until very, very recently, been taken for originals. In fact, they're not. And what is striking about this particular phenomenon is that I found a great many Coptic Arabic manuscripts at the Bodleian, for example, and I think this doesn't only apply to the Bodleian, um, which were copied in a similar way by Thomas Marshall. Thomas Marshall was collecting in the late 17th century. He never went to the Arab world, but he did go to Holland, where he saw the collection of Coptic manuscripts belonging to Fossius, and he copied them all out as though they were facsimiles. And the point about the collection of the is that he later managed to buy all the same manuscripts, so you can compare the two. And the facsimiles that he produced were very, very close to the originals. So this was a common way, but Thomas Marshall brings us to another category, um, let's say the second <coughs> great category of manuscripts, in other words, Arabic Christian manuscripts. And here the situation changes fairly radically. It changes radically because in the case of Christian manuscripts, Westerners went directly to the monasteries. I mean, there were, as I said, numerous channels, but on the whole, Westerners could go directly to the monasteries and could then try to buy manuscripts. Now, this, of course, leads to the great problem and to one of the words which I rather unwittingly use in the title of this lecture, theft. Now, one has to be terribly, terribly careful because the hurried departure through the back door, the undignified departure through the back door, pockets bulging with manuscripts, is not something that people were generally terribly proud of and wanted to record in print. <coughs> Particularly if, as so many of the, man of the manuscript collectors were, they were members of the clergy. So we don't have any personal records of this. I mean, the nearest we get is by a man who was accused constantly, but everybody was he was accused possibly more than others, and that's Robert Curzon, who in 1837 was in the Wadi Matul monasteries and entered a room in the Deen Baramus, where he found that the floor was strewn with loose pages. And he said that there was a page of vellum, which he said, I brought away. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, he brought away, because he brought away great many manuscripts, but he also paid for them. The question is whether he paid enough. I mean, he, of course, has been accused not only of stealing, but also of cheating. And his own description is that the monks, after drinking two bottles of a rather light liqueur, or rosario, which he brought with him for the occasion, were prepared to sell the Eclat Monastery. <laughs> and at that point, he got the manuscripts that he wanted at a very, very high price indeed. <coughs> but the, the question of theft, as I say, I mean, there's a great difference between the sneaky book thief and the triumphant warrior who returns home with a baggage full of looted manuscripts. And this must always be kept in mind. Um, but the second was applauded and the first not. What about the Coptic? How did one set about buying manuscripts? Well, the idea that the Copts were ready to sell absolutely anything was echoed throughout the 18th century. I mean, um, Stefano Evadio Semani, a member of a family which has an extremely sinister reputation in the Coptic world, said specifically that the Copts would sell anything. The, his cousin, Giuseppe Simonio Semani, 
managed to acquire and I cannot believe, since he was working for the Pope, he was working as a missionary, I cannot believe that he stole them. He acquired a great many manuscripts. He acquired, I think, 200 complete manuscripts from the Suriani in the Wadinat room, and he acquired 3,000 leaves from <coughs> the Makar in the Wadinat room. A great many. The idea that he'd been stealing, and this was an idea which was entirely other than specified. And if you see what the Copts were saying about the various members of the Asimani dynasty, it would seem that there was a sort of congenital leptomania which characterized the entire family. But in fact, uh, the Asimani's were hated. The Asimani's were hated because they were Maronites, uh, they were representatives of the Church of Rome, and of course, they, the Copts very much resented other Arabic speaking Christians teaching them how to join the Church of Rome and behaving like, let's say, the good boys of the Catholic Church. And if they also managed to make away with an enormous number of manuscripts, they hated them doubly. So this was really the great indictment of the Asimani's, that they were helping themselves, which in a sense was true. But I am quite convinced that at one point they paid. Because if one looks at the other records of travels in the 18th century, all of whom made for the Coptic monasteries and tried to acquire them, Coptic manuscripts, we see really a series of failures. I mean, Claude Granger, who in 1730 went to the wedding that one, wasn't even allowed into the monasteries. At the slightly later date, Sonini de Rancourt and W.G. Brown went to the monasteries, but weren't allowed to buy a single manuscript. So what actually happened? I mean, it would seem to me from the various descriptions that it depended in time on who was there just then, which monks. <laughs> we do get descriptions of the behavior of the monks. Uh, the monks, if there was just one monk, of course, then he would probably be prepared at a fairly high price to sell manuscripts. If there were more than one monk, then of course trouble started because they all wanted to share in the price of the manuscript. And so the value would go up and up and up. If the superior was there, it was really anybody's guess what would happen. I mean, sometimes he'd be prepared to part with the manuscript, sometimes he wouldn't. There were countless misunderstandings. I mean, the Codex Signaticos, which of course is not an Arabic manuscript, is an example. I mean, after many, many years in the Russian library, after many years in England, um, St. Catherine still has a vague feeling that this manuscript was perhaps stellar, because there's not paid a great deal of money for it, but that it shouldn't be where it is at the moment. Now, the last point um, that should be dealt with is the question not of how manuscripts were acquired, but of what manuscripts were acquired. <coughs> Here again, there's a very great difference, as I said, between the Middle Ages and the early modern period. In the early modern period, Europeans had, above all, a very great interest in history of religion and in history in general. And what they were searching for, certainly in the 17th century and in the 18th century, was a good, reliable historical account. Now, if one looks at the library of a learned Ottoman, a learned Arab, we see that the hierarchy it didn't correspond in any way to the hierarchy in Europe. On the whole, there was a very great esteem for theologists, and the public the equivalent of theological manuscripts. Then, after that, it will be followed very soon by manuscripts on jurisprudence. After that, I think it's probably the same to say, I'm not completely sure about this, but I, I would hazard a guess that then there will be a great many medical manuscripts. I mean, this is certainly something we see in the slightly earlier period. If you look at the library of Mortado de Mendoza, which they went to this called, yeah, there's an incredible preponderance of, of medical manuscripts. Then, at a slightly lower stage, subjects such as history, which are very great interest in Europe, lexicography, which was a very great interest in Europe, and finally, Again, I'm rather hesitant in the, the end of this hierarchy. Finally, literature, 
Uh, but that was very much depending on exactly what was inserted into that category. Poetry, almost certainly, of which the Europeans only had a very vague knowledge. And one great classical Arabic text, which are the Maqamat of El Hali, which have been discovered in Europe. These are little anecdotes in rhyming prose. And they were used at a very early stage in Arabic primers in Europe, so from the 17th century onwards, we do encounter them, and they were known. But there was one text which nearly every European visiting the Arab world wanted to acquire, and which hardly anybody succeeded in acquiring. Uh, this is after 1700. This one text was a text which had prompted countless Arabists to learn Arabic in the first place, which had been translated by almost all the great European Arabists in power, and that is, of course, the Thousand and One Nights, a text which in Europe had the most extraordinary success, and which was perhaps quoted um, in Victorian literature more than any other work except for the Bible. Uh, and every European child had read it in an expurgated form. And there was a great search for manuscripts. And one European after another returned to Europe disappointed because he couldn't find a manuscript of the Arabian Nights. And so this brings us to the status of the Arabian Nights in the Arab world and the strange way by which the Europeans themselves form the sort of imaginary canon of Arabic literature, which was then recycled to the Arab world at a much, much later date. Certainly, even then, the greatest Arabist, or one of the greatest Arabists of the 19th century, who translated the Nights, who wrote about them extensively, and who regarded them as the best existing guide to Arab customs, said that you would never find a copy in the library of a learned sheikh. And this is absolutely true. Because the learned sheikh would have nothing but horror and contempt for the Arabians. Uh, he would regard them as totally unedifying, extremely obscene. There's a slight contradiction in the fact that in some of the descriptions of, of the Arabian Nights written um, in the Arab world, they are defined as texts which are really intended only for women and children, with the sort of contempt with which the novel was described at a very early stage in Europe. But if they did enter a household, they were very frequently kept under lock and key, and they were kept out of the reach of women and children. And a learned Arab who heard, who might have heard the European attributing all this importance to the Arabian Nights, was probably in a situation equivalent to somebody who would hear the question to an Italian of what book should be read in order to have, let's say, a shortcut to payment customs. And the answer might be, don't bother with that, they don't bother with Manzoni, but we do not. I mean, if we then <coughs> make of the a uh, rather obscene work, which of course it isn't the which the Knights are, we have the sort of attitude or the sort of conflict of attitudes between um, the Arab contempt for the Arabian Nights and the European adulation. But as I say, this unites would, together with other works, I mean, the works of historians which have been known in Europe in the very early stage, such as Ibn Khaldun, thanks to Leo Africanus' description of Africa, which was published in 1550. Very rarely, the Europeans did build up their own hierarchy. And this hierarchy seems to me to have been gradually absorbed in the Arab world. So that by the mid-20th century, a great many Arab writers, I mean, let me take two examples, Tofik al-Hakim and uh, Tahusay, were influenced by the Arabian Nights, but also in the autobiography of Tofik al-Hakim and in Da'al Tarwan, they find a lot by Tahusay, they also remember the manner in which the Arabian Nights have been regarded by their parents' generation. Thank you very much.
there was a French diplomat called, I think, Réoncé, who was collecting the French court uh, manuscripts in Venice in the 1530s. And I think there's, I, I know he did have a lot of Greek manuscripts probably, and also some Hebrew. Did he do anything with Arabic as far as you know? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, what is certain is that it was possible that certain members to buy Arabic manuscripts in Venice. And Venice was the one place in Europe where there would seem to have been a certain market. But I don't know about the, the case of Dorsey with the you know, I haven't seen his collection. I mean, I know the collection of Yorier, the Bibliothèque and other collections of that period, but I don't know. I think it's been dispersed. dispersed. Where is it? I think it was dispersed. Uh, they were named there. They were mainly dispersed. But are bits of the Bibliothèque Nationale? What about in the Mazarine? Is there any, are there any manuscripts well, in the Bibliothèque Mazarine? Did they have any? The Mazarine, uh, to the best of my knowledge, does not have Arabic manuscripts. I don't want to be making a terrible mistake, but, mm -hmm. but I'm certainly not aware of Arabic manuscripts of the Mazarine. No, I mean, there are works by Arabists. But I'm not aware of Arabic manuscripts. There was an exhibition quite recently, and I don't think there was a single Arabic manuscript in it. Mm -hmm. Would have been added. Have there been any worth exhibiting? <laughs> so I think the answer to that is no. Yeah. Yeah. Totally happy with that. So. <laughs> yes. Uh, I would like to know. Thank you very much for this kind of fascinating talk. Uh, I would like to know if the um, hierarchy European scholars uh, call it to manuscripts or the interest they had in manuscripts, if it's still reflected somehow in contemporary Arabic studies, or if it should have um, another for if I put it differently, if there are things under study that should be um, which have had more importance in the Arab world, but uh, through the European prism somehow or through the European uh, um, you mean, what effect did the Arabic languages which were collected have on the European knowledge of Arab culture? Is that what you mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's a very, very good question. Um, it's a question I think you know, most of us are still able to answer. Because, all right, manuscripts are collected. They're put in libraries. But then, as Bainbridge said, there they remain. Um, it's very, very difficult to have access to them for quite a long time. I mean, you need them. It would take a very long time before they were catalogued, because it would take an expert Arabic to catalogue them. And consequently, I mean, the great catalogues of Arabic languages, the one produced on the Escorial by Cassidi in the 18th century, and the various catalogues of the Vatican by the Asemani and cousins, um, come out quite late and a very great value. But a great many manuscripts were only really diagnosed, as it were, particularly the ones which were miscellaneous or rather worthless texts, together with a couple of pages from rather good one, were only really properly diagnosed in the 19th century by the great French, German, and Dutch Arabists, um, and in the early 20th century. I think that yeah, so, so a few, sorry, a few, uh, a few of the manuscripts um, did indeed have an impact if they were published. But if they weren't published, I would say that it was fairly negligible immediately. I'm sorry, yes. Um, what, do, what do those three mean? Are those three um, manuscripts mean? Please? I'm sorry. I, I enjoyed all that. Oh, the, the on screen? Yes. What do they mean? Well, they're, 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 it's sort of from the Quran. Oh, it's Quran? Yes. Which one is it? Um, it's the. No, I'm sorry. Oh, it's it's absolutely it's absolutely scandalous that I shouldn't be able to answer that question. But it's absolutely scandalous that I shouldn't be able to answer that question. Yeah. It's not the story. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> and why has one, one, the middle one has, has got an extra line? Yes. Now, yes, the point of these, the point of these copies was that Hottinger, it was involved in a discussion about vowel points. Um, they're not, of course, they're, they're there are different copies of different parts of this manuscript in different oh, calligraphies. I see. That's why, you see. And he wanted to give an example of the different calligraphies and the use of vowel points. About which there was a debate, I mean, started with the Hebrew vowel points, and it just came into 
from the Arab ones. Thank you very so, much for the talk. Uh, I was just wondering um, what happened to the manuscripts following the sort of reconquest of southern Spain? Did those manuscripts, how did they, were they destroyed? Did they enter the commercial market? Um, did people collect them? <coughs> Is, has there been any study? Of, uh, um, yes, I mean, there's an increasing tendency to study this. The, the material is fairly thin. What we know is that I think Otago and Mendoza in his collection had a great many manuscripts which did come from southern Spain. There was a general effort, it seems to me, to destroy as many as possible. Some of them, however, survived, some of them were confiscated, and a great many of them, this was a Spanish scholar called um, oh my God, yeah, um, who ha ha is, is dealing with this at the moment, more and more coming to light. But there isn't, it seems to me, a very, very great part. I mean, they were confiscated also later from Morisco, so they were circulating. Um, I think that's as much as I can tell you just like that, you know, such and such. Did you get the answer? Yeah, I think it's a question regarding the use of this, because this was stimulated by an earlier thing which I saw uh, about the works of Chinese, Mongolian and Inner Mongolian works of various Buddhist texts. They have millions of this stuff discovered and what they decided was obviously none of their own people or uh, in fact would be able to get hold of it and work on it. So what they have done is now they are doing extensive uh, computer computerization yes. of these things so that it's available to the whole world for anybody yes. to access. Yes. They know the quantity is so vast. So why don't they do something like with this, uh, with these kinds of uh, valuable manuscripts in the Islamic world? So that you know, at the moment, as you said, there are no. Uh, not enough expertise to classify or do anything. Oh, so just they, uh, uh, kind of <laughs> over, over and you know, just if they computerize it, then whoever wants can can. Uh, work um, I think I think I must recycle that question to the gentleman who's sitting. Um, uh, no, <laughs> to Dr. Ropa, um, who's sitting there and who was involved and who certainly knows much more than I do. Yes. He, editor of the Index Islamicos <laughs> about the actual status of computerization of Arabic manuscripts. Well, there, there are a large numbers of them have now been, uh, now been digitized into <coughs> online databases. It's a lot of piecemeal way. Yeah. Yeah, libraries have done their own collections. But there are now quite large numbers of them. Yes. Shaking your mind, he was thumbing all over that. Not so much digitization. No, the no. catalog. Yes, catalog. Yeah, otherwise, it's a rather pity that they're only sitting and nobody is uh, doing anything with them. I mean, they collect their all. You know, it's it's a study progress. Oh, right. 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 Uh, um, just, just to comment to this, there is, okay. sorry, <laughs> technology is of course there, but the problem is the curation. To curate digital material is not the same as just digitizing manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's not so developed yet. And so I think that the question <coughs> No, it's just a comment. comment. Exactly, yes. No, yes so yes, we yes. Still, we're still looking into some new expertise that has to be acquired. Yes. New expertise, but also an enormous um, increase that in the 19th century and the 20th century of management, which went to the West. I mean, the colonial world, of course, were an enormous uh, um, source of, of, of management connections. I wonder when their descriptions when these negotiations are going on with various Istanbul League and booksellers, <laughs> if they were offered, for instance, Hebrew or Syriac manuscripts. If, if any, sorry, if they were if they were, if they were also looking for other languages, Syriac or Hebrew, for instance. Well, the um, Hebrew manuscripts they were looking for, they probably would not have gone to the same bookseller. I mean, the Islamic books that are sort of so Turkish, Persian, and Arabic manuscripts, but I think not Hebrew ones. But uh, the collectors who were interested in collecting Persian, Turkish, and Arabic manuscripts were very frequently also interested in collecting Hebrew ones and did so um, in Istanbul. But I know very, very little about how that worked, um, how the Hebrew manuscripts were collected. I mean, one, of course, one. Um, 
one of the safest ways of collecting manuscripts in Russia, either if you were actually on the spot or if you were in Europe, was through the agents who knew what they were doing. I mean, there were, there were several examples of agents. I mean, Gorius and Pocock, when they were back in Europe after many years in the East, used agents. They also shared <coughs> agents. A learned Muslim, uh, Darwish Ahmed, who was supposedly uh, the great advisor and who knew exactly what the point what to get and tried to find it. Not always successful. Um, sorry. You said that Zitzin left a diary about buying. And so what you said that Zitzin left a diary about buying yes. the manuscript in his novel. Has this been published anywhere? Yes. It's just been published by, by, by Orbs. By yes, by Orbs, O L M S. And it's terribly good. Um, it's in Orbsidam. The first volume is on Istanbul. The second volume is on a letter. The third one you can get online in a 19th century edition, and that takes him as far as the south of Damascus. No, it's Istanbul. And after that, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. This, this, uh, I know, because the, the only manuscripts in Oldenburg, because he came from Yeva, which is in East yeah. Friesland, yeah. Uh, and they're all in the library of Oldenburg. And I'm not sure. Oldenburg. Oldenburg, yes, yes. Uh, it was Istanbul that interested me, and particularly because he was there not very much longer uh, later than Van Dietz. Uh, he was there in 1800. Um, the Istanbul, that's the first volume, and that's now. It's an enormously long. I'm very Sorry, thank you. Yes. Well, it was just a quick um, You mentioned about the Egyptian and uh, Paris. Did, you, did they also acquire manuscripts through diplomatic gifts? That is a very, very good question. And I slightly <coughs> avoid that because, yes, they did. But the manuscripts they acquired as gifts were very frequently the result of looting. Ah. I mean, if you again look at the Vatican Library, there was a Coptic delegation, it was not absolutely certain, but it seemed very, very, very probable, that the Coptic delegation of the Council of Florence in the late 15th century brought with them a number of manuscripts. I mean, this is certainly true of the Christian manuscripts, but they also brought manuscripts by the Ghazali, and they also brought other Islamic manuscripts. Um, the, I have a feeling that the Islamic ones might well themselves have been looted. The Coptic ones, no. But I think the Islamic ones might have been. So, but no, no, I mean, this is true. But actually, we're the less gifts than one might expect of um, Arabic manuscripts. In the early 1700s, I think the Royal Society here in London had a couple of Muslim members. I'm sorry, they, they had in the early 1700s, the yeah. Royal Society had a couple of Muslim members. They did, yes. Did yeah. they bring anything to the I don't know, because there were quite a number of Arabic manuscripts circulating around the Royal Society, okay. um, thanks to people like Channing and, and um, various members of it. Um, this slightly later, the Russell brothers, this is slightly later in the 18th century. Uh, the Russell brothers certainly did, who were members, or did bring um, manuscripts with them. Uh, the early, I can't remember because there was, of course, a recent general exhibition of the Arabic um, holdings of the Royal Society, and um, I can't remember the dates of the early, of the early one, or what. Alistair, you told quite a cautionary tale of the dangers of going to Istanbul and trying to buy a manuscript. I wonder if I could ask you to, to turn it on its head the other way around. I mean, if we wanted a good example of how, how something really good came to the West, um, what, 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 how, could you give an example of, some, of, of how that, you know, what might one try to imitate if one was an early modern person who wanted good stuff? Um, I mean, there, I think the answer is an agent, mm -hmm. a friend. I mean, don't buy in Morocco, would never buy a manuscript directly himself. He collected quite a number, and he sent a friend to get them for him. Uh, and the, the really valuable stuff, as far as I can make out, I mean, take, for example, the Library of Alpinas, which, which is now Cambridge. Um, some of the most spectacular manuscripts, and Alpinas never went to the East, and some of the most spectacular manuscripts were found at a very great expense. Um, in Istanbul by agents and sent back to So I think the answer to that is an educated, an educated agent. And that's how Gordius probably got his best manuscripts, Pocock too. That was really the solution. 
And thank you for, I mean, that's <laughs> a very important point. Thank you for asking. Would you call Ganon an example of that? Only the, the, the Ganon, when Ganon was back in France, he was receiving manuscripts from me. He's presumably from an Asian. I didn't know who Asia was. When he was in Turkey, he was by, it would seem, directly, judging from his diary. Montel and Colbert. Yes. Yeah. yes. But yes. would you call him an agent, or would you call him uh, what is, Ah, that, that, I, I see what you mean. No, I'd call him a collector. I mean, simply, if it's a question of, of, of vocabulary, I, I would call him, in this context, a collector, not an agent. I mean, the same goes for someone like Van Sleeve, you know, who was collecting all the property mm -hmm. manuscripts. Mm -hmm. so. I call him a collector rather than nature, although he was collecting for what that. Mm. And he was very badly treated, as we know. Okay, well, uh, let us thank you one more time for your beautifully lucid uh, lecture and for answering so many questions so patiently and <laughs> informatively. <laughs>